Welcome to A Legacy of Empowerment, a workshop about using the lessons of the past to guide the PTAs of today and tomorrow. My name is Jane Harsha, and I am New York State PTA past president. And my name is Patty Frazier. I'm currently serving as the New York State PTA treasurer. We'd like to start off our workshop as we start all of our workshops, and that is with the New York State PTA mission. PTA is a powerful voice for all children, a relevant resource for families and communities, and a strong advocate for the education and well being of every child. Our mission is based in the efforts of our founding members, and it is a continuation of the tradition that we have in PTA for the past 125 years. Another continuing tradition is the New York State PTA purposes, which were originally called objects. There are six of them, and the first five are very similar to the ones that were adopted by the members 125 years ago. As you look at these, you can see the first one is a general purpose to promote the welfare of children and youth in homes, school, places of worship, and throughout the community. And then that general purpose is subdivided into different areas in terms of standards of home life, promoting collaboration and engagement of families and educators, engaging the public in these efforts on behalf of the welfare and well being and safety of youth and children, and also to advocate for specific laws that further those issues. The final one is to advocate for fiscal responsibility regarding public education funding. A brief view of our New York State PTA history. PTA founder Alice McClellan Burney attended the School for Parents at the Chautauqua Institute in Western New York in the summer of 1895. There she participated in a, a course called Child Study and from there she developed the idea for drawing mothers together to work for better homes, schools, and community. Upon returning home to Washington DC she met with Phoebe Apperson Hurst, our second founder, who provided both intellectual and financial support. Mothers across the country were invited to the first meeting in Washington, DC from February 17th through the 19th in 1897. Those of us that live in the Northeast might be thinking to ourselves, wow, Washington, DC in February, what was the weather like? And how are we going to get there? Were we going to tra travel easily by train as, as women, as mothers leaving the home? Amazingly, 2,000 attendees, including those from New York State, participated in the meetings and events. The New York State delegates did not waste any time. They began organizing right away with Mrs. Fanny Barnes from New York City appointed as chairman. Later, she served as our first New York State PTA president, and she was elected to the presidency in Syracuse, New York. It was the Syracuse Mothers Club that invited all interested mothers and community members to come together in September of 1897 for the first annual meeting. We're so thrilled to be back in Syracuse for the 125th annual convention. 50 members attended from Syracuse, New York City, Oswego, Utica, Albany, Auburn, Waterville, Fayetteville, and Fulton. So a special shout out to all the people out there that may be um, doing, uh, serving PTA in those communities. From our very beginning, our PTA leaders understood that to accomplish the goals, they would need to have a seat at all the right tables. This was very forward thinking for women in 1897, considering they did not yet have the power of the vote. Our early efforts of New York State PTA focused on parent education and the reforms needed for the highest and best development of children. And we were recognized early on for our efforts. At the annual meeting in 1899, Governor Theodore Roosevelt was a keynote speaker and Mrs. Roosevelt held a reception for the delegates at the executive mansion. And also as far back in 1903, members were urged to write to their legislators to support reform bills, much as we do today, though we do most of our work through email. 
Our partnership with the New York State Department of Education began in 1925, and we've worked with the New York State Department of Health since 1927. 1933 brought the formation of the Educational Conference Board, of which we are still a member, along with the big five school districts and the various education-related unions. In 1938, the New York State PTA legislation chairman was asked to share what bills we would be supporting. And then again, in 1950, our influence showed once again when the governor sought out our recommendations on several education bills. In 1974, February 4th, was proclaimed the PTA Day in the state of New York. This was to mark the attendance of many PTA members um, on visits to their legislators in Albany. We continue that uh, event today, um, and it is now known as PTA Lobby Day. On the New York State PTA website, we list our significant collaboration with 11 key coalitions, commissions, and boards. In addition to the Erie Educational Conference Board, that includes the Board of Regents, and then Education, Family Engagement, Health, and Rural, Health, Rural, and Teaching Profession um, organizations. Certainly a note about our seat at the table couldn't have, could not have been more evident if, than during the time of our, our COVID um, experiences and our schools being closed. We were called on many times by the Board of Regents to provide input and parent um, volunteers to serve on various roundtables and commissions they were holding. In the past, we've also been asked for our opinions on parent involvement and school vouchers. Whether we think of it or not, PTA is actually an organization of empowerment. As Patty mentioned, despite the fact that women in 1897 could not vote or hold office, they decided to band together to take efforts on behalf of children and youth. And so they created their own Congress, our own Congress, uh, which whether you call it the governing body of a nation or a group of delegates that are meeting to take action on issues certainly describes the actions of our founders. So the founding itself was an act of tremendous empowerment, interestingly by the less powerful who were women who had very few rights. They did not have the right to um, own property once they were married, their property would pass, all possessions would pass to their husbands. They didn't have custodial rights to their children. Um, they didn't even really have custodial rights over their own bodies in some cases because their husbands were able to commit them to sanatoriums or for rest cures, sometimes against their will. So they really had very few legal rights, and yet they decided that they could band together and have an impact on behalf of children who had even fewer rights than they did. They were really a very unprotected group at this time. So it was an ambitious forward-thinking group that decided to take action. And while they called themselves the Congress of Mothers, their Congress was open to all members of any uh, gender, or as they put it, also of any color, creed, or condition, which in 1897 was quite a forward-thinking thing to do. In fact, there's a reference to a White, House con a White House reception that was given by Mrs. Cleveland, the first lady, at the time of the organization's meeting in 1897, that says, Mrs. Cleveland gave a reception at the White House to all mothers, irrespective of race, and it was a curious and interesting sight to see such a throng of women hastening to the White House, because clearly in the past, there had been no reason for women to be in the White House since they didn't hold any positions of authority. So we see that from the very beginning, there's this attempt to empower this group to work on behalf of children. In the 1897 convention in Syracuse that Patty just mentioned, uh, one of the first committees formed was a committee of reform with the initiative to improve the lives of all children. In 1899, PTA members or Congress of Mothers members were first asked to petition Congress for reforms in juvenile justice system and juvenile court, which was really not much of a phenomenon back then. Um, juveniles were generally prosecuted as if they were adults, regardless of how young they were. This is one of the essential issues for this group in the very beginning. In 1903, they were asked to do a letter campaign 
to write to legislators to endorse a reform bill for again, juvenile courts, and also for child labor protection laws. Child labor was another one of their major issues. It, by 1912, New York State PTA had established a legislative chair to be in, responsible for these activities. And we had already worked out a process and methods to carry out our advocacy. So we see this pattern of members of the organization identifying an issue, doing research and study in groups on it, trying to educate their members and raise awareness in general in the community, then proposing reforms around that issue, and then moving to advocacy to lawmakers and policymakers who would be able to bring those reforms about. And we can see this is essentially the same process that we follow today. There's also a pattern of collaboration with government, other organizations, and higher education, and a pattern of doing studies of different topics. Um, this is a very common thing for PTA to do early on from the 1900, early 1900s forward to do serious academic studies about different issues, to come up with, to advocate for regulations and laws, and to be interested in education issues as well. And we also were very much involved with communication and helping these organizations and government entities to communicate with parents in particular about the different issues that would affect them. The other thing we'd see is that there's, again, a consistent concern for issues of children's health and protection, for their well being, or what was then called their welfare. Not only of one's own child, but of all children. And this was a really big commitment from the very beginning from PTA. A lot of the members who joined were people who did not have children currently of the school age. So they were from day one working for other people's children and the welfare of children overall. We also see what we might call today has been called the PTA way of developing their members where you start by educating parents on issues and parent education was a major, major initiative of the early PTA. So you educate parents on the issues, then you engage them in pursuing those issues and acting on them in the organization. They work together to help you produce resolutions and policies around those issues and then to carry out advocacy actions and then ultimately to become leaders of the group and restart the whole cycle with educating new parents and engaging new parents and coming up with new policies. So it really is part of our empowerment to tap into what I'll call the pure power of the volunteer. We are a volunteer-based organization and our volunteers do everything from running the organization to staffing events, to fundraising, to administering local units. It's all volunteers. So because of that, we have a kind of pure power when we go to advocate on behalf of children and youth, because it's clear that if you're a PTA member, you are not in it for your personal advantage. In fact, you may end up spending money, <laughs> expending time and effort that you could have put otherwise on PTA. So it may even cost you something to be a volunteer. But this gives us great strength when we go in to advocate because we are taken seriously in the issues that we decide to support and the positions that we take. So oh, true, Jane, and I think it's kind of an interesting fun note. You know, we constantly are encouraging our, our units of today to stay mission focused, to make sure that their work um, matches our mission. And even back in 1911, even though we understood we needed to have a seat at the table and what it would take to get a seat at the table and to stay empowered. It was the uh, leaders, the New York State PTA leaders at the time in 1911 were approached by the suffragist movement to ask for the support of PTA to help bring the vote to women. And um, we did not accept that request only because we felt that we needed to focus on the work that we were doing for children. So um, we're going to take a look at some of the initiatives that exemplify our legacy. And I'd like to start with um, looking at the work that we've done in the field of health. 
It's PTA's position has always been that parents and families have the primary responsibility for the health of their children. In 1897, we started with a hygiene and physical culture committees that were formed at the very first annual meeting. And shortly after that, a survey went out to, to parents and mothers um, across the state and to ask what their concerns were. And interestingly, I think parents of today can relate to all of the concerns that we, can, we still find for our children. Concerns of wearing the proper clothing, school lunches, proper and the proper amount of sleep and exercise. Our preventative health measures, most notably, um, were nutrition and the harmful effects of tobacco. Those have been longstanding ones. Um, in 1925, the PTA partnered with the State Department of Health and the State Education Department to help local PTAs advocate also for school nurses, dental vision and hearing care, hot school lunches, and social hygiene, which was the precursor to health to sex education. We also have used PTA um, influence to work towards better prenatal care, free maternity wards to fight infant mortality, screen, and then also the screenings for vision, hearing, and then the addition of scoliosis. Just wanna talk a little bit about our, our work on nutrition. Um, the school lunch and breakfast program I've talked about already, um, we really were at the forefront of making sure that these um, were brought to fruition in our schools. We also have advocated for the women, infant and children um, supplemental um, food assistance program, also known as WIC, um, and also things like improved food inspections and ingredient labeling. Certainly during COVID, as we fast forward to that, you will have find um, we had uh, reached out to all of our families not just our local PTA units, but all of our families that we have access um, to, to let them know that we were here to help if there was any um, food challenges. And certainly we um, advocated for the continuation of the free school lunch program despite, despite the fact that school buildings were closed. The tobacco use um, for minors, um, we have longstanding since, in, since our very inception of access to minors, um, we've advocated against that, and certainly to make parents aware not only of the harmful effects of smoking, but also of secondhand smoke. In 1964, New York State PTA joined with National PTA in a massive effort to educate parents on the dangers of youth smoking, and work on this issue continued through the 90s. The techniques and the, the methods that we use to bring about the um, spotlight for this issue were certainly the similar to the ones that we used in more recent years when we um, wanted to stem the tide of vaping that has um, certainly reached um, deep down into our youth population. Um, we, we were at the forefront of that in New York State in, in bringing about resolutions and positions um, to advocate against the use of vape, vaping um, devices and the sale of vaping devices. That work was also adopted by the national PTA as well. So again, a great partnership to, on, to advocate on behalf of our children. Juvenile protection is another area where PTA has been very active from its very onset. Um, in 1899 uh, was the first time that we adopted a position um, calling on uh, the courts to be reformed and to form juvenile and youth courts so that children and, and youth would not be tried in, in adult court. Also asking for separate facilities for youth as well. And um, also for things like age appropriate services for children who were involved in any kind of, or accused of any criminal activity. So there are many, many positions on this. We have a lot of resolutions on it as well. Um, in the area of juvenile protection. And this, while this has seemed largely perhaps a, a more settled issue um, about mid 20th century, in fact, we came back to this again in the 27, 20 teens with what's called the raising the age issue, raising the age of criminal responsibility. Because at the time, New York was one of just two states in the United States that was still 
prosecuting minors of 16 and 17 years of age as if they were adults. There was the sort of default pros prosecuting of them as if they were adults. And so after some years of advocacy in 2017, the law was passed to amend the situation as well as to provide intervention and treatment um, services that were, would be age appropriate to minors. And again, guaranteeing that they would not be held in the same facilities as adult offenders, and they would be treated in these uh, juvenile and youth courts for misdemeanors and for potentially for some felonies, depending upon the situation. So this is a place where we were engaged in 2017. We were a little late to come to this, uh, back to this issue. I think we were kind of caught up with some other things that seemed to be important at the time. Um, but we did in the end, uh, we have a position paper and we you know, were happy to advocate on this issue until it was passed. We also were active in child labor law in the 1900s and 1930s in particular. At the time, children were not required to be in school. They were often pulled out to work for their families and they could be working full-time as young as perhaps five years of age. Smaller children were often used to work in crowded spaces, uh, for example, to clean out chimneys because they could actually climb into the chimneys. So this, they worked under some pretty awful conditions. So PTA advocated for there to be better working conditions for children, as well as ultimately a minimum age of employment which by the 1930s was set at um, 16 years of age. Um, and also that there would be a minimum wage because there was no minimum wage for children either. Now that 16 years of age for employment then coincided with another uh, resolution that we had on compulsory education that was turned into law. So the compulsory education in New York State was required to, to the age of 16. So in other words, students had to be in school until they were 16 and only after that were they able to work legally. We still have a compulsory education resolution in effect, which would raise that age through 17 until the age of 18 when, when youth are adults and you can no longer require them to do that. Um, but that is something that uh, we have not achieved yet. So I could suggest that could be a good thing for a, a unit to decide to uh, advocate on because certainly we see the benefits of, young people staying in school as long as they can to, to finish and graduate. Um, another area that we have been active in is in discipline. And uh, school discipline in particular, it may seem surprising, but um, it wasn't until the 1970s to 80s that corporal punishment was finally phased out and eventually prohibited in schools in New York State. So we had been advocating for that for many years. And we have also advocated for fair and equitable discipline of children, age appropriate discipline, and more recently have been involved with um, promoting the restorative justice practices and looking at fair and equitable discipline in terms of gender and gender identity and race and ethnicity and religion, which can be factors in the um, un unequitable discipline in public schools sometimes. Another area where we have a great activity in juvenile protection for many years is media safety. Beginning back in 1910, when there were positions passed to advocate for be better quality vaudeville and movies, all the way through um, sensational newspaper columns, sort of lurid tabloid to newspaper reporting, um, comics, that had violence and inappropriate activities, radio, television, TV commercials, um, which were influenced they, with the truth and advertising concept, and also of course the internet and social media. So this is an issue we are constantly trying to um, keep safe spaces for children on the air and through our networks um, of communication. And that will probably be an ongoing issue forever. And then there are a lot of other, what we might call socioeconomic concerns, where we have positions that would fall into the juvenile protection area. Um, children in poverty, children who are homeless, children in foster care, uh, what we would now call diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, domestic violence and sexual harassment, uh, nonviolent conflict resolution, student privacy issues, fair housing, 
personal safety, hazing, prejudice, and even child labor laws um, in the 1990s, we passed a resolution calling on uh, PTAs to educate parents about child labor limits because there were a lot of children who were working essentially 20 hours or more outside school hours, uh, which was really interfering with their schoolwork and their development. So even today, we do have some child labor laws as well that we are advocating for. And I would just say we have over 20 resolutions in this area as well. Thank you, Jane, for that. Um, yes, resolutions and are all um, compiled together in our Where We Stand document. And there are numerous ones um, related to all of what we are focusing on today, both health and juvenile justice. And so we encourage you to um, look through them for your own um, actions in your unit. Um, but I wanted to touch a little bit more on mental health, which we feel like that has just come again to be um, part of our daily concern for our, our students, our families, our, our staff in our buildings um, when it comes to education. But honestly, mental health for PTA has been, again, something that we can trace back to our roots. It has really been on our radar since we began. And I re referenced earlier our survey of parents in 1899, um, asking them for their health concerns. In addition, um, one of the things that they responded to was the fact um, of the medical value of fresh air and deep breathing three times a day as, as ways that we thought that we could improve the lives of children. And certainly we can, you know, um, fast forward that to our current day, we have um, had many um, areas of New York State PTAs advocating um, fiercely for the return of recess for those um, schools that had abandoned it and for those that still had it to continue recess. Um, certainly is so important for our children. And, and we know that with the restorative practices, many of our, our schools are practicing yoga and all types of deep breathing. So I think that, um, again, we, we are, our efforts are still relevant today. Additionally, I, you know, we talked earlier about our, our partnership with the State Department of Health that started in 1925, that also um, recommended um, our efforts for mental health. Um, mental hygiene became an emphasis of our state PTA. It was a year long theme in 1927 to 28. All of the work that we done, we, kind of, we did that year, we put through the filter of mental hygiene. How, will it, how is this helping our children? In 1969, we began a three-year state project um, emphasizing children's emotional health. So again, a switch from mental health to emotional health, but still both things um, you know, affecting our children very much today, resulting in the establishment by the governor of the Committee for Children. So again, our influence really as, as a statewide association bringing um, action um, on behalf of our children. Today, we enjoy an ongoing partnership with the Mental Health Association in New York State, also known as Mahaney's. Um, you will see we have an increase in workshops and webinars on the topics of mental health and social emotional learning, many of those that we have done in partnership with Mahaney's. So another area of our legacy of, of activism is what I'll call rapid response issues, that throughout our history, PTA has been able to respond very quickly to the immediate needs of the time. Some particular issue or problem crops up and we have the resilience and flexibility to be able to respond. Because we always work from our mission and our principles, and that is always the basis, the core of whatever we do, we have guidelines which allow us to go into action, determine if this is an issue that we can act on or what sort of stance we might want to take. Um, we have positions and policy which are updated over time. We've had hundreds and hundreds of resolutions since the founding of the organization. Um, most of the ones that we have now are from the 90s or later. We have a few from the 80s. So we keep them in place until they are no longer relevant or hopefully are turned into the laws and regulations that we are looking for. Um, but we have a deep um, bench of this kind of policy and position to draw on whenever we are considering something 
that we might want to take action on. And then finally, we do have that tradition of, of education for advocacy so that we are educating people, raising awareness on whatever this new issue is, and then putting all of these things together, our mission, our principles, our positions and policies, and that education, we come up with an advocacy plan to be able to address the particular need. So if we look at this, we will see that we also have a system that works for us. We will identify the issue that is the current need. We will research it and study it. Frequently, although not always, we will write a new resolution, which looks at what we want to have happen and why we want to have happen. If you were at the um, passing of resolutions, the updating of resolutions in a previous session, of convention, you saw that there's a, a whereas section to new resolutions and then a resolve. And the whereas is why do we want this to happen? And the resolve is what do we want to have happen? So it's a commitment to goals and actions specifically that members can then take to use to train and educate other people and then ultimately mobilize them to act at anything from the local to the national level, depending upon what is necessary for that particular issue. And always we have that whole child, the whole well-being, welfare of the child in physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, um, social sense, every particular aspect of the child's life, as well as the every child, that whatever we do is for the whole child and for every child. So that too helps us to be able to determine what we can do in a given position where we don't have too much time to decide to how we're going to, to um, act. So one good example of this was the AIDS um, epidemic in 19, the 1980s. As you may know or recall, um, AIDS was a very stigmatized disease. Um, there were children who had AIDS for various reasons, and they were often excluded from schools. There was a lot of pushback from the community. They were isolated and shunned by other children in many different situations. And so the PTA saw this as a really urgent need to be addressed and to commit itself to an initiative of school and community education and outreach on this topic so that they could educate parents in the communities to see what was feasible and these children really shouldn't have to go through that kind of treatment and what were the various things that could be done to assist them in, in school. One of the things that the state did then was to create an award to encourage local units to be doing this education at, in their own communities for local AIDS education programs. It was also a topic um, several PTA conferences at the time, including inviting the parents of a young man who had AIDS to speak and interact with the parents and help to expand their view of the topic. So a very successful program to try to educate and change the environment around this illness, especially as it related to children. A more recent example, of course, would be COVID, um, which Patty has already mentioned in terms of our health, mental health initiatives. Um, when everything shut down overnight, it seemed in March of 2020, suddenly PTAs that were used to being in and out of school and, and having person-to-person uh, -person programs and lots of activities like that with refreshments and things that were no longer possible, had to find a way to help keep their members engaged and active. And if there ever was a time where we needed to educate and empower members, it was during COVID so that people would be, parents would have some control over what was happening in their children's lives. And there would be good communication between the school and the home so that these parents that were in effect homeschooling their children in at least in supporting them at home would be able to work in a good productive collaboration with the school. So we also had to find a way of conducting PTA business since we do have independent units in, in all of our, throughout the state, many of them. And it was just the season to be um, wrapping up programs, planning programs for the next year, uh, electing nominating committees and running elections, having the annual business meeting. So we had to quickly put together resources on that and run training and web chats to help empower people to be able to still keep their PTA operative, even in a virtual space. We also did a lot of work to connect parents and community members in general with essentially community services, um, 
whether it be providing food or helping to get better internet connections or any other support that parents might need, mental health resources, um, anything like that that they might have needed during the COVID period um, with their children at home and, and that children might need as well. And we also turn to, because we do still educate our members and parent and volunteer education is a big part of our mission. We found ways of doing virtual trainings, virtual chats, virtual webinars, so that we could keep all this activity going. And even if people were not able to take action on these issues in the traditional way of visiting a legislator or having a legislative breakfast or something like that, they were still enabled and empowered to be able to contact their legislators and keep that communication going, which is such an important part of our work and was really essential during this whole pandemic and continues to be essential during the pandemic. The other rapid response that we had to do last year was our convention, where we suddenly realized and, and moved in early September to have a virtual convention. And two months later, in November, we had the virtual convention 2020, which for technical reasons, we had to have a con call a conference, an annual business meeting, but it was our convention. And so in the end, even though everything had to be done virtually, we ended up with the same uh, program of workshops and panelists and invited speakers and elections and resolutions and bylaws and even a virtual exhibit hall that we could use to replicate as much as possible and do the essential business that we would need to have at a convention. Okay, and one last example that I'll mention is something that we are involved in right now, which is that, um, there is this organization uh, or e effort called Democracy Ready New York, um, which we um, have collaborated with. We are cooperating members in this um, collaboration. And it addresses the need of students to have more civic education, um, education that will allow them to be competent participants in our democracy. Um, many of us had civics when we were in high school, but a lot of those courses have fallen by the wayside. And now, if ever, it's really important to educate students about this. They have a constitutional right to this kind of education. And we have to go to great lengths to teach them both civic and information literacy, because there is so much misinformation and disinformation that's available now through the internet and social media. Uh, there's such polarization of views in our country that it's very difficult for a young person to be able to discern what's real, what's not, what's valid, what's not a valid source. So this is an effort to um, infuse public education with this kind of information, this kind of training. So this is, again, a need that is perceived now, partly because of the election cycle, the presidential election cycle that we just went through and um, that we're taking action on by joining in this effort with this organization. All of these things uh, wrapped up together present our PTA culture, how we are actually living our PTA lives now and how we have lived them. And we know, as, as Jane was just saying, that volunteer development is really one of the most important features we have in PTA. Throughout our history, our efforts have always been and will continue to be led by volunteers. Volunteers, we as you know, those of us that serve at the state know that we uh, volunteers are our most valuable resource. They are our members. Um, we um, again are a grassroots association, and so to our efforts are to support the grassroots, not to tell the grassroots what to do, but rather to listen to the grassroots and let them tell us what to do. Um, this kind of relationship where we are supporting our volunteers will help keep our PTAs in the present on track and moving forward and as well as secure the future of both at the unit level and then at the New York State and by further extension at the national PTA level. Leadership um, at the unit level and at the state level, as we all know, for the most part is volunteer and that leadership as, at a volunteer, as a volunteer position continues all the way up to the national PTA president. 
Um, parent education, and again, our members, as through our meetings who are attending, has always been a PTA tradition and will continue to be a PTA tradition. Um, we feel that parent education is the best way for us to communicate um, and bring about what is best for our children. We're not directly educating the child, that's up to our schools, but we are um, working with our parents to ensure that they have all the tools they need to um, have their children be successful. And when we have our seats at our table, we know that our seats are open to everybody. From the Chautauqua Institute to Washington DC and now back to New York State, we, our tradition of parent engagement is to welcome all to our table. And so while diversity, inclusion, and um, equity programs are springing up all across the country, know and be assured that this has been our promise since the beginning of PTA that we are here for all children and by extension, all parents. So our training of parents through with parenting and family engagement um, advocacy issues and PTA programs is an essential part of PTA and it's offered at every level. And this today, what we're participating in is just another phase of our training. So um, we appreciate everybody um, taking part in it and we encourage you to share the word um, of the amount of PTA training that's available. Um, training has started from the beginning, um, again, bringing groups together to talk about issues and, and decide how they're going to act on them again, is a longstanding PTA tradition. It also gives everybody the opportunity to network. Phoebe Apperson Hurst and Alice McClellan Burney were expert networkers to find each other in, in Washington, DC in 1897 to, to get the uh, things in motion to start the PTA. Um, we want to always be doing the same thing, connecting together with the people we know currently and to be attracting new people that will support our mission. Training will help everybody, whether you take your training individually or in a group setting to be um, better educated, how to help your children. Um, and, and then to go to be by extension, better PTA members to keep our association growing for the next 125 years. And then also active citizenships. I think all of us can point to local PTA leaders that have gone on to serve either um, on the school board in elected positions there, or even in elected positions on local government bodies. We want everybody who, who feels it in their um, abilities to step up and, and serve as leadership in, in leadership roles. We are obviously always in need of leaders. I mean, that is what helps our structure um, so that we can um, be ready to um, work and move PTA efforts forward through our programs. We need leaders to help um, umbrella that. And then through, through leadership training, the leaderships can leaders can serve as examples and, and also help to create skilled, well-informed and effective volunteers um, for our PT efforts. And through all of this, we want you all to know and we want everybody to share in the fact that we do volunteer our values. We value our volunteers and we want them to feel valued um, doing the work that they do. So with this legacy of a culture of the sort that Patty just described and all the advocacy work and the work on behalf of children that we have done, we might say, well, now that we're here looking into the present and future, what can we do as members and as units and councils? So one of the things that is really important, I think, is to be proactive. We should never assume that any parent or community member knows what PTA is, has had any experience with PTA, um, and will just automatically join because they know, well, that's the thing that you do and to be involved and things like that. So I think it's important to engage people by getting the message out. This is what our organization is. This is how we work. This is what we try to do. We will help to empower you as a parent or family member, and we will help to uh, work to improve your child's life and outcomes in school and in home and in general, um, your child just as much as every other child. 
So I think these are things that parents don't necessarily know and other potential members, and it's something we need to do. We also then, once people have joined, need to help them understand our mission, our principles, our ethics. Um, we do like to collaborate with people, but we have high standards. So we have to know what can we do and what can we not do in PTA. And there are workshops on that, if you're interested. Um, our current policies, as well as our historic advocacy, because it's PTA, yes, is a, a parent, uh, a family and child advocacy organization, but it has a long history. And I think sometimes it means more to people when they join an organization that has been doing the same kind of work in the same way and having an impact for 125 years. And so these are things that are not something members will necessarily be able to find on their own or understand their own. So it's important to be able to share that information and help to empower them to decide that they want to be members and volunteers. Parent education, community education leads to more informed decisions in all areas, whether it's in home life or school life or community life. And it really is the first step towards taking action. If you're going to take action on anything, then you need to understand that situation and what is the kind of action that you want to take to get the effect that you want to bring about. So these are really important things that we sometimes, as I say, I think take for granted. We think, oh, well, everyone knows PTA and they're probably tired of having the same kinds of programs about who we are and what we do. But I think that is something that we need to get out there every single year to every potential member to take our story to them and let them know who we are and what we're there for. Another thing that we need to do is to be confident. We often take action, say on lobby day, New York State PTA lobby day, on the issues that the state legislation and lobbying team has determined are their priorities for the year. Usually there are three to five of those issues and they make up these nice um, packages of information and provide a lot of supplies um, and resources to be able to use so that you can go to Albany for lobby day and advocate with the New York State PTA delegation there. Or you can lobby in your home turf, in your legislator's home turf by going to their office or having legislative breakfast or something like that at the local area. But we tend to focus on those lobby day issues. But it's important to remember that that just happens to be the priorities that we pick each year um, that vary from year to year. And frankly, they're very often contingent upon the proposals in the governor's budget that comes out in January and other legislative proposals that are in the works for the legislature's session in the spring from January through May or June. So um, they are a limited selection of the things that we can, we can take action on. So you can take action on any policy that we have in PTA, anything that we have in a resolution or a, or a position paper or our list of legislative priorities. Um, if you choose that to, take, to do that with your unit, as long as it's based on our mission and our policy and is consistent with that, even if there isn't a specific resolution that addresses it, or a specific action that you've been told you can do, you can come up with your own ideas and devise those. And of course, if you need support or have questions at any time, you can always contact your region director and other members of the governance team, the New York State governance team, who are involved with these issues. So keep in mind that voter voice, which is the one that we gives us the little template, the letter, you can just fill in a few facts, your own story, and then send it right off. It's very easy to use. And we certainly hope that all members will use that. It's such an easy way to advocate. And it is very effective to have those, the numbers of communications from members going to legislators. But you can also use that to construct your own letters and your own communications with your legislators too, and mobilize your local unit that way. The other kind of thing that we perhaps don't do as much as we should, and I think we used to do more of in past decades, I guess, um, is to take visible action to not only have programs or um, have advocacy efforts that we're conducting through you know, email, text, et cetera, but to actually physically do an action that brings attention to an issue. So a good example of that is something that was called Lights On for Education which was adopted as an initiative in 1962 by New York State PTA. And this was a program that took place 
in the winter generally, the first time was in January and subsequently it was done every late February, or early March during the legislative session in Albany. And it was done in support, with the support of the teachers, principals, superintendents and school board associations to on a given night across the state have every school turn on its lights and hold sessions open meetings where education issues and legislative issues would be discussed at the same time that supposedly the legislature was starting its work in Albany and its legislative session. So this was a chance to have educators, parents and community members discussing the issues and needs of education, um, the legislation and budgeting that might be necessary to secure those issues and to raise awareness and increase interest in advocacy, lobbying, one might say, on behalf of those specific issues. Um, it was an annual project. As I say, it started in 1962 and lasted till 1973 as a statewide effort, but it continues in some form throughout the state in different areas. And one variation on that was for some schools to some PTAs to adapt it to their local school area. And generally the night before a school budget vote, perhaps to have an open house or some other discussion of what was going on in the schools, um, displays, a show of student work, of school projects or resources that would motivate people to go out and vote on the budget and vote for their school board members. So very successful effort, but it's the physical part, all those lights on all across the state at the same time on a dark winter night has an impact. It raises everyone's awareness of education, public education, and that there are needs, our children need a good solid public education system and the legislature needs to, and, and state officials need to provide that kind of support. A more recent example took place in 2015, um, where there was a, a member uh, driven, single member who came up with the idea of a timeout. At the time, uh, you may recall, there were new initiatives. There was a new teacher evaluation system, APPR. There were new common core learning standards and there were new standardized tests to test children on those standards all rolling out at the same time. This created a great deal of angst and confusion. And it was such a fractious environment that New York State PTA advocated for a brief moratorium to just basically back off, take a time out, have everyone pull back, look at the situation and decide how could we move forward in a more rational and orderly and productive way on these various initiatives. And so, um, a, a, an action for that that was devised was to actually call a timeout. And so there was at least one school district that did a sit down. And so they arranged on a certain day shortly after the school day started, coordinated with the school district that there would be a, a bell and everyone in the school, student, administrator, teacher, parent would literally sit down for one minute all together, stop all action and just sit as a statement that said, we need this time out. We need to take this time out as a state to decide what we wanna do and get some control over the situation. Of course, the media had been pre, <laughs> pre notified that they were going to be doing this. So it got wide coverage and it was a very powerful way of making a simple statement, which is that we need to control the chaos about this and just try to be more rational. So again, a very physical kind of thing. It was not very difficult to organize, but it really had a profound impact. As Patty mentioned also, we want to encourage participation of everyone. We want to welcome everyone to volunteer and leadership development. We often tend to train our leaders when we have already appointed or elected them. You become president and then you take the workshop on being a president, for example. But what about training those people before they take on those offices, which will also open up the possibility of taking on an office like that to any volunteer, any member who takes that training. And we want to do this with all of them so that we can develop each volunteer to the maximum level that that person can and wants to reach as a engaged parent, engaged community member, and as a volunteer for children in public schools. 
So we have attendees. I suggest you open your events to non-PTA members as well as much as possible. The person who attends and appreciates the information that they've gotten there may well decide to become a member. And then that member may decide to engage more fully is in addition to just buying a membership to become a volunteer and ultimately an advocate and then become a leader. And there are many of us at the leadership level that began that way. Some people even reluctantly going to that first PTA event, but being won over by our mission and our, our activities on behalf of children and youth. So it's really important to include everyone and to make the effort to include those people. If you have people who are not going to understand your communications in English, then you have to find a way of communicating in the language that they will understand. If people are not able to get transportation, then you need to find a way of making it possible for them to participate either virtually or to get that transportation. So there has to be real outreach to open the circle wide and try to bring everyone in. And then the final thing I'll say is that we could, should continue to collaborate. You can collaborate on the local level just as easily as we collaborate at the state level. So there's the PTA network, I'll call it, of units and councils and regions and then state PTA. You can collaborate with other PTAs. Certainly that's a great way of gaining more coverage and more manpower to do your activities. You can advocate, you can collaborate with community organizations of different kinds as long as they have a similar kind of mission and practices because we do not want to collaborate with someone whose values as an organization are not compatible with ours. That would not be good and in fact is prohibited as much as we can prohibit anything in PTA. With other New York State PTA partners, as Patty mentioned, there's a list of those on the website and there may be a local unit or chapter of that particular um, organization or with other groups, as I say, that are similar in their pursuits and in their standards. And also with higher education, as we had in past years, in the early years of PTA, um, there is a lot of successful collaboration that can happen with colleges and universities in your area, especially in the area of programming, You know, something like how to prepare your child for college. It's a perfect thing for someone from the college to come and give a little talk on for your PTA. By doing this, you will be sharing the work with more people. Many hands make light work. You'll expand participation. Maybe you have a small group and the other organization has a small group, but together you have a larger group. And to broaden the impact of what you do, because it's not just within the context of your PTA unit, but throughout the community with other groups that will also be visibly supporting the same issues and um, uh, collaborating with us in trying to get those accomplished. So as we bring our workshop to a close, we would just like to um, share this final quote um, from Margaret Jenkins, who not only was the New York State PTA president, but went on to become national PTA president. Only through new, new PTA ventures in leadership and responsibility can we fulfill our, our obligation to protect America's children, preserve their freedom and dignity, and enhance their educational opportunities. We have some resources to share with you, um, some that you're probably already familiar with, our New York State website, our resource guide can also be found there, a list of our webinars and workshops from the past, as well as the national e-learning link is there. And of course, we always encourage everybody to contact their region director for further help and to join our New York State PTA Facebook groups. We have one for diversity, inclusion, and outreach and New York State PTA leaders. On behalf of Jane and myself, we appreciate you joining us for this workshop. Thank you.